Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. And I'm your host, Mike Allen. You know, Connecticut's had a lot of important and famous people live here within its borders over the centuries. But arguably, the most important one lived here in the 1600s. And without him, well, Connecticut wouldn't have developed the way that it did. His name was John Winthrop Jr., one of the earliest governors of the then young Connecticut colony. It was his knowledge and his skills that shaped Connecticut in several critically important ways and set it on the path to where we are today. Well, here to tell us about Winthrop is perhaps the foremost expert on him, the Connecticut State Historian Emeritus Dr. Walt Woodward himself. Walt has written two books on Winthrop, and he did his doctoral thesis on him as well. He's going to be along in a moment with Winthrop's incredible story. Well, let's do this week's trivia question. Another one of the most famous Connecticut residents ever almost got swept out to sea in the hurricane of 1938. Who was that famous person? We'll stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to ynhhs.org. That's ynhhs.org. Well, this is a wonderful episode personally for me because we're able to welcome Dr. Walt Woodward as a special guest. Walt retired last year as Connecticut's state historian, a role he had held for nearly two decades. It's an unpaid position, but it does come with a stipend as a history professor at UConn. Now, Walt was not originally a historian, and he'll be the first to tell you. In fact, he has quite a fascinating background, including prowess in both music writing and advertising. He wrote a couple of country music songs early in his career. He even won two Emmys for his musical work in film and TV. In advertising, he won eight Clio Awards, and if you know that business, you know that's a prestigious honor in that field. And then he turned his sights to history in Connecticut. Well, Walt Woodward has written five books since becoming a historian, two of them devoted to today's topic of John Winthrop Jr. Now, Winthrop was one of Connecticut's earliest governors dating back to the 1600s when we were a very, very young colony. Connecticut could have gone down many paths, but Winthrop's 20 years in office provided the state with a very special royal charter directly from the King of England himself. And he also started some early entrepreneurial businesses, and that's a trait that continues in Connecticut's sort of image to this very day. Well, one of Winthrop's many incredible accomplishments was securing that royal charter in the 1600s from a very reluctant King Charles II. You see, the king's father, Charles I, was the first monarch ever overthrown and executed in England, and it all happened at the hands of a band of men associated with Oliver Cromwell. Well, several dozen Englanders, elite Englanders, sat as judges in that case. In fact, they had to affix their thumbprint next to their initials, officially signing the death warrant for the king. Well, there was a 10-year experiment of running England without a king, and that failed, and then the king's son, Charles II, retook the crown, and you can understand he was a little bit upset and wanted to do away with the several dozen men who had sealed his father's fate. Well, a couple of them had fled to Connecticut and even hid out in the legendary judge's cave on West Rock overlooking New Haven, and they were never caught. So when Winthrop went to Charles II to legitimize Connecticut by granting it a royal charter, well, you can almost imagine the tension in the room when that discussion finally took place. Well, we're going to leave the rest of the story for later in the discussion with our special guest today, Dr. Walt Woodward. Walt, first of all, it is an absolute honor to have you on the show, and I think that, first of all, you were the Connecticut State Historian for nearly two decades. You came into that role somewhat mid-career and 
when you went for your history PhD, I think it's fascinating that you decided to go after John Winthrop the Younger or Junior, however you want to refer to him, to do your dissertation. You subsequently wrote two books on him. And why does John Winthrop come to the attention of Connecticut state historian Walt Woodward as somebody to focus on with all the different people in history you could have chosen? What I'm about to tell you is a true story. It's living proof that the most unintended consequences can come from the simplest things. I had just come to Connecticut to come to graduate school. I'm a midlife guy, but I am a brand new graduate student. And I thought, well, I'm going to go to Sturbridge Village because I really want to go see what that Sturbridge Village is like. And I got in the car and started driving up there as like my first or second weekend at UConn. And I got lost going to Sturbridge because I didn't, of course, take 84 the way other people did. I took the back roads. I ended up not at Sturbridge Village, but in Southbridge, which is about five miles away from Sturbridge Village on a kind of pretty but really remote back road. And I came across this historical marker, rusty. Somebody had put it up certainly in the 1930s, but they hadn't looked at it since then. The state sort of forgot they put it up there at the time, I think. And it said, on this site in 1644, John Winthrop Jr. established a lead mine near here. And I went and walked around and looked at it. And sure enough, there's this big hole in this hill. I am a new graduate student at this point, but I know that in 1644, for somebody to come that far from the sites of settlement to try to open a mine in the middle of what truly would have been in English eyes at that time, wilderness. And I thought there's something wrong here. So I need to find out what this is about. And of course, to answer that question, you start with John Winthrop Jr. Who was he? What got him there? The answer to that question really involved a very unique person with a strong background in what in the time was state-of-the-art science, developing this totally unique vision of New England as a kind of godly scientific research community. That's how I came to John Winthrop Jr. I got lost trying to get to Sturbridge Village, and then I became a historian. Let's talk about John's life. So here he is, a guy who will live 70 years. He's born in England, and of course, if you're talking early Connecticut history, it often starts in England. He then comes over at the ripe age of 25. What do we know about his dad and, and the son and, and the role he played and how he helped his dad in the Massachusetts colony? It's really interesting. John Winthrop Jr., he came in 1631. His dad came in 1630. Winthrop's father was chosen kind of as the governor of Massachusetts Colony. He was one of the leaders of this movement to bring a major migration of Puritans who felt threatened in England and felt a need to practice this intense religion that they genuinely believed was essential to their salvation. When he got here, he made this speech that has become an icon of American history. He told the people who came with him, we're going to be a city on a hill. And essentially, he says, if we live the lives we want to live, if we do the things we hope to do, we'll be a beacon to the rest of the world of what a godly society can accomplish. His son came behind him. He shared those Puritan beliefs, but he was in many ways different than his father as time went on. Now, one thing that John Winthrop Jr. seemed to do from an early age, relatively speaking, age 27, was he was founding new settlements and doing things like you said earlier of creating lead mines and going out into the wilderness. So at the age of 27, he founded what is today Ipswich, Massachusetts, correct? Absolutely. He went up to do a kind of industrial development. He wanted to set up a salt works up at what is now the site of Ipswich. 
Winthrop had become very interested when he was in England in the then science of alchemy. When you think, oh, they're going to turn lead to gold, it's like, wow, fabulous wealth. But many of these alchemists thought of religion and science and magic, too, as kind of all part of the same thing. And turning lead to gold was a symbolic transformation as much as it was a real transformation. And in a way, they think this mirrors the purification of the human soul through conversion to Christianity. It definitely was the framework in which people like John Winthrop Jr. came to practice science. People in this time think this is a world on the verge of some huge transformation. After all, a whole new world had been discovered, and now God is purifying religion, and Europeans are coming into this new world to help bring what they saw as these heathen and lost people to the knowledge of the Christian faith. Winthrop wanted to be part of that transformation and to do it using science as a background. So wherever Winthrop goes, when he's starting towns, he's looking for good strategic locations to do things. He's like, in some ways, he's like a good venture capitalist. He's looking for places where science is really going to produce results that will benefit the people of New England and hasten the millennium, which is the long expected return of Christ to Earth, where he's going to reign for a thousand years. So, Walt, the next real undertaking, he goes back to England and then comes back to help two lords who have gotten titled to some land along Long Island Sound, and they ask him to start a settlement there. Tell us the story behind Saybrook. The development of New England in these early years is closely tied to the deteriorating conditions for Puritans back in England. James I, he had had a mildly tolerant view of these Puritan religious radicals but he died in 1624-25. He was succeeded by Charles I, who wasn't quite as accepting of them. And during Charles's reign, the Anglican Church became much more seriously concerned with cracking down on the Puritans in their midst. Charles I felt that it was not just a threat to the Anglican Church, but kind of a threat to the good order of the English government. I think people began to realize that things are getting really bad and this could lead to civil war, which it did. So they could see these storm clouds coming. Some of the really most powerful Puritans in England began to think, well, maybe we should think about going over to New England too, because it's just getting really uncomfortable here. We want to be sure if we come there that we can practice our kind of Puritanism and exist the way we want to. So they decided, you know what? We're not going to go join Massachusetts. Those Bay Puritans, they were really, really strict in their Puritanism. We'll go to the New World, but we'll start our own colony. So Lord Say and Seal and Lord Brooke purchased a patent uh, land on the southeast coast of Connecticut from the Earl of Warwick. It was called the Warwick Patent, and it included the mouth of the Connecticut River and the land around it. They got a group of very, very well-heeled English Puritans to agree that they were going to join together and emigrate to southern Connecticut at the mouth of the Connecticut River and create a plantation, they called them. They wanted someone to manage this project who could have good relations with the people of Massachusetts and also supervise the construction of some really nice homes for them to live in when they got there and just kind of make it so that when they got off the boat, they could set up shop and live something like in the manner to which they had been accustomed in England. They made the, what I think was probably a wise political decision to hire the son of the governor of Massachusetts. And he was 
to go over and supervise the setup of this colony. He hadn't counted on the fact that the Pequot people would resist this arrival. And the Grandees in England hadn't counted on how badly relationships among the Puritans would deteriorate while they were waiting for this new colony to be set up. So from Winthrop's standpoint, the effort to set up the colony, which is called Saybrook after Lord Say and Seal and Lord Brook, was at least thwarted in meeting its goals because the settlement at Pequot was effectively under siege. Back in England, the Puritan grandees, things got so bad that they said, you know what, we can't leave here. We have to stay here and defend Puritanism. And if we have to, we're going to have to fight the king, which is what ultimately ended up happening over there. So Saybrook was the only colony that could claim some legitimate permission from England to have a colony in that part of the world. Connecticut had set up its government on its own. They didn't ask the king's permission. They didn't ask anybody's permission. They got together and wrote the fundamental orders. If you read the fundamental orders, they never mentioned the king. They mentioned God. Saybrook was based on the Earl of Warwick's patent. Connecticut wisely figured that it would be really good to have some legal basis for our existence. So they made an arrangement to sell the colony to Connecticut, which really meant sell the patent to Connecticut. So the Saybrook plantation was absorbed into Connecticut. So he goes back to England, 1641. He comes back in 1643 or thereabouts, starts setting up the ironworks, including the one that you stumbled upon in your early research at UConn and then goes about founding the area we now today call New London. How did that all come about? This is where getting lost on that road, trying to find Sturbridge Village, paid off in gold for me as a historian, because it's totally connected with this 1641 trip back to England. Winthrop was always interested in the mineral, we would think chemical resources of New England. What kinds of minerals might be out there? He asked traders to bring him interesting stones. He asked indigenous people to bring him samples of what they found. And he was going back to find investors to help set up an ironworks in New England. New England had to import all the iron it used And he knew there would be a good market for it here. But before he went there, a trader had brought him some stones from this black lead ore. We know it's graphite now, but one of the things it was considered to be was bismuth. Where you found concentrations of bismuth, it often meant high concentrations of silver deeper in the mine. Winthrop began to think this was bismuth and there might be high concentrations of silver here. So he sent people out to get more samples of this ore and he came back, he did more tests and he went, oh my goodness, am I right? Is there more? So he's thinking that somewhere in Massachusetts, there could be a huge silver mine there. Maybe God means for us to find silver here. And think of what you could do in the name of science and religion if you only had the resources. So he's sending ore to all his alchemical friends in Europe. He's saying, assay this. Tell me what we've got. By the time he gets to England, he gets enough confirmation that there are high concentrations of silver in this ore that he's ready to double down on it. He arranges to buy the land around this mine site from the indigenous people. He buys it a couple of times. He sends some English people to buy it with an English deed. And then he sends Robin Cassisinamon, who is the leader of a group of Pequots. And he sent Cassisinamon as his native agent so that There'd be no question 
whether everyone understood what was going on in this transaction. He believed that the mine was going to be the most important place in New England. He believed it so much that when he was in England, even after he had raised the money to build the ironworks, he wrote to people back in Massachusetts and said, we've got the money, you're going to build the ironworks, but I'd really like to get out of that now. I'd like, I'm busy with other things. He had this plan. He was going to create a research center for godly alchemy in the new world. It was going to be funded by ore from the silver mine that would be shipped down the Quinnebog River, have it held and loaded at the mouth of the Long Island Sound, then processed, partially shipped to England, refined, and Winthrop would create a town right at the mouth of what we now call the Thames River, because his vision, we don't think about how brash this would sound in 1645, but when you tell somebody in 1645, you're going to create a new London, they look at you like, really? You know, we're, this is New England. We're just getting set up here and you're going to create a new London. You want to call it new London. When he first went to the Connecticut General Assembly and said, we want to name our town new London. They said, no, said, it's a nice name, but you can't do that. Call it Fair Harbor. Well, people of New London went back again. They got turned down twice. New London didn't actually become New London until, I think, 1658, which was shortly after John Winthrop became governor of Connecticut. Then suddenly it was okay. So Winthrop is developing this vision where Christian alchemists from Europe are going to come gather. They're going to work on these improvements that will help human life. That's going to result in the improvements that we need to have in human society to hasten the return of Christ to the world. It is a stunningly grand vision. Certainly wasn't realized in Winthrop's lifetime and it was never fully realized, but I find myself now, I just kind of marvel in how many ways New London kind of mirrors that vision. You have this great Pfizer Research Center there. Well, John Winthrop created New England's first hospital in New London because he was the most sought after doctor in America. People came to him from all over New England, both indigenous people and English people. They wrote to him from the Caribbean and from Europe seeking his advice. He actually went up and down the Connecticut River holding medical clinics because he developed, using his alchemy, medicines that people thought were incredibly effective. Walt, I've heard the story that when Winthrop went over to see Charles II to get the royal charter, that it was obviously a tough sell. And what I read in a rather obscure book he claims that Charles II was obviously not in favor of this royal charter idea, but that John Winthrop the Younger produced a gold ring that was supposedly given to John Winthrop Sr. by Charles I, and it brought Charles II to tears and actually broke down the reluctance. Have you ever heard that story? Oh, yeah. There's a wonderful... I think 18th century, well, the poem's not wonderful, but the story is wonderful that describes that exact thing that Winthrop goes to court and he takes a ring and he wins over Charles II. It's a poem that was written, you know, long after Winthrop was dead. If there's truth to it at all, it was a story that was handed down. It's a pretty cool story. There's not evidence for it in the historical record that I ever saw. I studied Winthrop and the Royal Charter a great deal. There are two things that struck me as I was studying this. One is it, it was just a coup. It was amazing. You do wonder for what are the factors. And one of the things that I was stunned by when I saw it, 
There are a couple of portraits of John Winthrop Jr. And you look on the charter, there are lots of portraits of Charles II. Those two men look remarkably like each other. I can just imagine when they walked into a room together, the first thought they had was, wow, he looks just like me. So, uh, you know, that's a sidebar to what I think was, in fact, a political decision on the part of Charles II that Winthrop went along with and then he didn't. And it was this. There had been a move afoot for a long time to take all of the English colonies from Massachusetts down to Virginia or maybe Maryland and unite them into one colony called the Dominion of New England. It was definitely something that was under discussion at the time Winthrop is seeking to get the charter. It's going to become an effort on the part of Charles' successor, James II. He literally creates the Dominion of New England for a couple of years, and he's overthrown. But what I think was going on in the royal charter is that Winthrop, a very adroit politician, was able to present himself to Charles II as a reasonable New England Puritan who was willing to support the crown, at least, you know, as long as Puritan beliefs could be protected. Charles II, I think, thought that by being generous to Connecticut, he could win Winthrop over to supporting the idea of uniting all of the New England colonies together, creating one government under a royal governor. I think the generous royal charter was an effort on the part of Charles II to co-opt a very powerful and influential New England leader to support a royal program that was going to be implemented in subsequent years. Once Winthrop got back with the royal charter, he gets requests from various crown-connected officials to furnish a whole lot of things that would support this effort to unite all the colonies. And Winthrop realizes what's going on and just deflects all those requests for information. He is not forthcoming with hardly anything. And once Winthrop starts resisting, there's an effort to start taking back provisions of that charter. So that's my take on what I think was happening. Whether there was a golden ring involved, I don't know. It's a great story. The thing I think about legends is that whether they're true or not, there's often something in them that's very important to the people who tell the legend story. So there's something about Winthrop showing up with a gold ring that for many people defines something about that relationship. That wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. One of the many other accomplishments of Governor Winthrop was his handling of the entire topic of witches. It used to be in Connecticut that once you were formally charged with being a witch, you were executed 100% of the time, no leniency. But after he became governor, it dropped to 0%. How did Winthrop change that? Well, you're just going to have to wait for a future episode and Walt will be back to share that incredible story. I do want to thank our guest for today's program, Dr. Walt Woodward, Connecticut's recently retired state historian, a post he held for nearly 20 years and now appropriately carries the title of Connecticut State Historian Emeritus. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was another one of the most famous Connecticut residents ever, almost got swept out to sea in the hurricane of 1938. Who was that person? I know Walt knows the answer to this one. The answer is actress Katherine Hepburn. And next week on Amazing Tales CT, besides having that little brush with death, Hepburn had activists for her mother and father, and wait until you hear about that. And she still holds the record for the most acting Oscars of any male or female actor in history. 
Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Please be safe and stay healthy. Thank you.